Now, when it comes to fate, there are a lot of characters within that franchise as a whole that are extremely overpowered and brought up in cross first conversations because of how strong they actually are, which is completely f fair considering how strong these characters are in terms of their scaling. But there are a lot of characters in fate, despite being incredibly overpowered, if not as overpowered as the most talked for, uh, characters, that aren't actually talked about. And one of these characters is Ostafo, who, if you don't know, is an androgynous looking boy who is part of the 12 paladins within the series. And with an actual legend, he is a son of an English king and one of the 12 faithful paladins. Obviously, that's kind of what Ostafo's whole thing is, really. Among the 12 paladins, Ostafo, within le actual legend, is be said to be one of the more handsome fucking <laughs> lady men type characters. But within this fate series, Ostafo is just a chaotic, good, pink haired femboy who is potentially gay. But Ostafo's strength isn't something that is primarily talked about in comparison to his character as a whole and how his character brings a sense of warmth to the audience. But really, how strong is Ostafo? Now, when it comes to fate scaling, there are a lot of things you would have to understand. That And those things you have to understand primarily comes from the mechanics of the games and how they rate the character's stats within the context of the games, as well as other side material and promo materials, and so on. Now, if you look at the parameters and stats presented for the writer class of Ostafo. Ostafo does have a D in strength and a B in speed, which the speed half is rather good within the context of Fate as a series. To understand the parameter within Fate and how it works, the parameter rules are a set of rules for representing the relative power of each item, ranked by letters under a different system or different systems in general. So translated into specific parameters for no particular reason. And there are five main ranks going from weakest to strongest. There is E, D, C, B, and A, and each have a quantifiable number assigned to it, inserting one to be a normal value. E is equal to 10, and it only increases by 10 up until it reaches a. This means that there's a at least a 10 times difference or something similar between each rank, meaning that even the higher dimensional scaling performed by other characters, i.e. Saber, Gilgamesh, etc. can still somewhat apply to Astolfo, just to a weaker extent, since you can't just be, say, 10 times stronger than a character and then have, say, dimensional scaling that would put them on a dimensional scale here above someone like Ostafo. And when you're talking about dimensional scaling within a power scaling context, <laughs> like you need to consider, hey, even though there's a 10 times difference, these characters are still within the same, the same dimensional tier of strength, even if there's a 10 times difference between them. And this, this applies to Ostafo when comparing him to other powerful beings within fate. Ostafo is still within the same dimensional tier of AP, just to a lesser degree in comparison to some of the more stronger end characters within Fate, like Gilgamesh, for example. Who Gilgamesh, I will be bringing up for the majority of this video for a point of reference on where Ostafo does scale in an out of verse setting, so people can use my boy. Now, for this comparison I will be making, characters like BB basically became the Moon Cell via absorbing the power of it, like giving her the same dimensionality as even the core of the Moon Cell, which is in fact important and I will get into. And while well, yes, as I mentioned, Gilgamesh is stronger, and <laughs> it's shown via the parameters as well, going off of the difference, as I mentioned, Ostafo would still scale to Gilgamesh, and 
Gilgamesh actively is stronger than BB and was able to defeat BB in a fight. So BB is a primarily way, primary way to scale Gilgamesh and then Ostafo. Since if we know that Gilgamesh is above BB, we have a way to scale the dimensionality of these characters as well as their tiers of power. So what is the dimensionality of the moon cell and its cores for reference for BB, since that's the main way to scale BB after absorbing the moon cells? Well, the moon cells themselves is a supercomputer created by aliens slash these non-human intelligent life forms that consists of seven different layers and getting past them gets you to the moon cells core. The moon cell itself was made to observe and record everything on Earth and everything about Earth's like Earth and ever since its creation. The moon cell is has well an eighth dimensional barrier and blocks most if not everything away from the moon cell's core. And the moon cell's core is said to be an even higher dimension. If you want to lowball this statement, then it would likely make the moon cell's core at least ninth dimensional. But there are characters like uh, who do talk about the moon cells having and containing imaginary numbers of space, which would scale the moon cell's core above the this ninth dimensional tier of dimensionality and to understand the imaginary numbers of space within the context of fate as well as our IRL versions of imaginary numbers of fate. <laughs> the imaginary number of space contains all possibilities as well as all possibilities that can be thought of because it's unobservable. It can't be detected by current existing laws of physics, the reality of real numbers and imaginary numbers, which are mutually exclusive and untouchable, as well as they can't observe each other. The imaginary numbers of space is are basically higher dimensional spaces made up of complex slash imaginary numbers and is the source of poor information and is sometimes referred to as the guardian fall from the sky within the right side and and reality itself is made up of real numbers. And within the realm of mathematical abstraction, imaginary numbers serve as powerful tools for describing phenomena that transcends the confines of the real world um, and what we observe within the real world. They extend our like understanding beyond the tangible realm, allowing us to basically explore concepts that exclude the direct empirical ver verification. In this vein, con uh, containing or connecting imaginary numbers to the notion of higher dimensionality involves delving into the boundless expanse of mathematics and mathematical abstraction. Now, when I go into this, I'll explain in depth, and for the things I'll be referencing, I'll be referencing a lot of books, as well as textbooks as well. Um, these books will be things like, say, books by James Ward Brown, or basically Tristan Needham, or other uh, writers within this field of work, like J.B. Uh, Kilperb, who wrote all these great books that are sources of this imaginary number of space and what I'm going to rant about for the next few minutes. Now consider the like concept of dimensionality within mathematics in like <laughs> conversional in conventional Euclidean uh, spaces dimensions are typically represented by real numbers with each axis orthogonal to the others. However, when we venture into higher dimensional realms, traditional notions of dimensionality begin to blur with each other. Imaginary numbers offer a gateway to these higher dimensionalities uh, and dimensionals, but and just dimensions in general, uh, allowing us to basically uh, can see, um, sp basically allowing us to confer space that transcends 
the constraints con or basically restraints of finite dimensional geometry. One way to basically see this uh, connection is through the framework of complex analysis. In the complex plane, numbers are represented not only by their basically components, but also the <laughs> their imaginary co components forming a two-dimensional space. Through the manipulation of complex numbers and functions, mathematics explores patterns and structures that transcend the limitations of real numbered spaces. Extending this further, um, we can imagine spaces constructed not just from complex numbers, but from hyper complex numbers, such as like quaternions, which in fact incorporates multiple imaginary dimensions. These higher dimensional spaces provide groundwork for exploring exploring abstract structures and phenomena that defy traditional intuitions, which within the concept text of mood cells, how imaginary numbers of space applied to scaling these fate characters, imaginary numbers serve as the linchpin connecting our tangible reality to realms of boundless abstraction just as how just how imaginary numbers offer a basically a pathway to higher dimensional spaces within mathematics they also provide a way to scale these characters as high as high hyperversal where the imagination uh, resides supreme and the boundaries of possibility stretch infinitely thus the connection between say imaginary numbers and infinite uh, dimensional lies at the axis of mathematical abstraction as and so on and other things similar offering a glimpse into the vastness of the unobservable and the indefinable meaning that the moon cell's core can be scaled to high hyperversal via imaginary numbers of space meaning that would scale to bb via absorbing the moon cells as well as the moon cells core and scaling to gilgamesh and then ostafu for the reasons i mentioned earlier and then talking more about ostafu he does have access to things like his hippogriff which is like an otherworldly phantom horse which is also ostafu's favorite mount that he actually secured on a mission which you know, mind you, he has ridden other mounts before, uh, like he has a horse, a griffin, so on and so forth, but this hippogriff is his fucking favorite, and he even flew to the fucking moon with his hippogriff, and on top of that, that and on top of being extremely fast, Ostafu's hippogriff does have a charge that allows it to use the power of an A-rank attack, making it actually stronger than Gilgamesh by a significant amount. And Ostafo, in his saber form, which isn't as popular as his rider state, does have comparable attack stats to Gilgamesh himself. So this just secures that Ostafo is still in the high hyperversal ranges of power. And... Due to Ostafu being a servant, abilities that can apply to basic servant phys physiology can still apply to Ostafu. Just to name some, but not, not all of these abilities Ostafu would have because of basic like servant physiology. Servants have like divine ministries, and thus a spell directed at them can be nullified as long as they have a, like, more mystery, basically. And giving them, and as well as Osafu, forms of power and nullification, and even conceptual weapons within fate are able to attack entire concepts, such as space, <laughs> as well as nullifying said concepts, like immortality by overriding them, giving the servants, like, s spatial manipulation, law manipulation, like, regeneration and immortality negation via causality negation, as well as likely some higher forms of power nullification. Servants may also undergo an assertion or, or an ascension through strong emotions, 
such as anger giving the servant in question a rage amp. And luck can not only change the user's fate, but, uh, but also the reality. And also, it's basically giving them some sort of like fate manipulation via their luck. And Ostafo has really high levels of luck. Servants can also perform spiritual attacks that can cleave souls and <laughs> just negate resistances, which is just crazy. And there are, as I said, more abilities that would apply to a Sofo due to basic servant physiology. So just these alone make a Sofo extremely cracked. So in conclusion, a Sofo, despite not looking at like it, He's an extremely powerful character in his own right, with abilities to actively back it up. Also, having scaling that, as I said, could unironically get him as high as high high reversal on the high end via the moon cells core and imaginary numbers of space, which is unironically crazy to think about that this little fucking pink haired femboy is this powerful.